Hi, everyone. So nice to see you. And thank you for all our guests. Welcome. It is uh, noon here in Baltimore, but five o'clock somewhere. Uh, so hopefully you're enjoying a drink, whatever that may be. And we're just happy to have you here today. So I am Jamie Seward, Associate Director of Affinity Engagement Programs with the Office of Alumni Relations here at Johns Hopkins University. Before we proceed, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsor, the Finance Affinity. Now, before I turn the program over to our speakers and introduce our moderator, I encourage you to ask questions in the Zoom Q&A located at the bottom of your screen. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator, Nick Ginsberg. Nick is the Vice President of Investment Banking at Goldman Sachs, focusing on quantitative finance. He currently heads up the division's Municipal Debt Capital Markets Data Science Group, building quantitative models for the bank's city, state, hospital, and university clients. Nick has a bachelor's in computer science from Hopkins Whiting School of Engineering and a bachelor's in economics from Hopkins School of Arts and Sciences with a minor in financial economics. He's also a very active volunteer with our finance affinity, a frequent attendee at our events, and he serves on his reunion committee. So we're very happy to have him involved and here today. And Nick, I will turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Jamie. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Really, really excited to see um, everybody come out and really excited to have all of our panelists here. And, and thank you again for that, that really lovely intro. And um, before we, we move into it, for all of our panelists, I'd like to uh, hear your, your elevator pitch. Uh, give us a quick intro on, on who you are and what you do and um, maybe you know what you, you studied at Hopkins as well. I can just start calling on people if you want. I'm happy to start. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. My name is Liz Lemro. I graduated Hopkins in 2010, uh, studying applied mathematics and economics with a minor in business. I've spent the last 10 years of my career in wealth management, um, starting my career at Bessemer Trust and now with JP Morgan. I've been both on the investment side of things. So, you know, creating the solutions that we are, um, you know, advising clients on. And now I'm on the client side advising you know, individuals, families, entrepreneurs, not-for-profits on ev everything from investing, planning, lending, banking, etc. cetera. Um, I spent the first 10 years of my career in New York and Palm Beach and have recently moved back home to Baltimore uh, to build out JP Morgan's private bank office in my hometown and also close to Hopkins. So excited to be with everyone today. Thank you. I'm incredibly jealous that you were located out of Palm Beach. I don't know why you left, but I'm trying to trying to make my way down there. <laughs> I was 24 and, you know, a third of the age of everyone there, <laughs> but it, it was great from a work perspective. <laughs> Definitely fair. Um, Joseph, you want to go next? Sure, happy to. Uh, I'm Joe Yoon. I am Hopkins class of 2000, which I think makes me the oldest one amongst the entire group here. So I'll be filling the role of old man in our conversation today. Um, I, I was an econ major and uh, originally from Boston, Massachusetts. Now, uh, the, the trip down to Baltimore kept me down this area. I am currently in lovely Great Falls, Virginia, and I, I work for a registered investment advisor firm called Timescale Financial, which, funny enough, is based out of Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, I've been in the industry for a little over 20 years. Um, Similar to, to Liz, I was more on the institutional side at one point, helping uh, build a broker dealer that faced uh, registered investment advisors. And so I helped them with their platform needs, clearing and custody, and then uh, as well, um, you know, practice management and those sorts of things. In, in 2015, uh, my daughter was two. We were talking about having another child. I didn't feel like roaming the United States anymore after having seen 43 states. And so I, I also made the transition to working with individuals and, uh, and it's been fantastic helping impact their, you know, their financial planning needs. Um, I'm a certified financial planner and live in Great Falls with my wife, two kids, two miniature dachshunds and my mother. So it's, uh, it's a nice full house. And I, I have nothing to, I, I have no location to give you, uh, Nick, in terms of being jealous. So I, I apologize on that front. Okay, you, you got the two dogs down. So I, I definitely appreciate that part. 
Uh, Carolina, last but, but certainly not least, good to see you. Likewise, um, my name is Carolina Hernandez. I graduated from Hopkins in 2014. I was an international studies and political science double major and I minored in economics. And I have been working at JP Morgan in the private bank, very similar to Liz. I started um, as a summer intern in the summer of 2013 in our Greenwich, Connecticut office, uh, which is where I am from. And I went back for full time, did three years there as an analyst. And then uh, when I went through what is called our analyst to associate promotion process, I um, switched to working in New York City at our headquarter, where I have been ever since, in a similar role to Liz right now, advising clients on all aspects of wealth management and their balance sheet and have a really diversified book of families that I work with. And um, I live in New York City currently um, and really excited to be joining you all today. Thanks, Nick, for moderating. Awesome, pleasure. Um, so let's jump right into it. Um, so the, I wanted to start off um, and ask you guys, in, in a time and an age of you know, all these FinTech startups and you know, we seemingly have just unlimited options for you know, personal investing and they range from the traditional brokerages, the Fidelities, the, the Charles Schwab's and stuff, um, to the, the trendy ones like Robinhood, to robo advisors like Acorns or Betterment, to the more alternative ones like Coinbase or Gemini or even Masterworks. Where does somebody start? You know, where do you begin and, and how do you start thinking about the landscape and what's best for you? I see we're all jumping at once to answer the uh, the broad based question. So I'll uh, how about this? I'll I'll start and then I'll I'll let the ladies uh, fill in all the stuff that I miss. Um, you know I I think all three of us would probably say that that's that's a difficult uh, question to answer because it, it is so individualized and um, you know as someone who has you know has has my own. Coinbase account and and whatnot. As I have I have uh, clients asking about uh, crypto, it, you know I, I think and and actually there was a question that came in via the um, via the Q and A asking about you know talking about the stock market, but maybe that's not for everyone. I, I I still sit here in and I say in a society where we are you know capitalistically based and driven. If you look at a chart of the stock market. Um, you know, it goes from bottom left to top right. There, our system is built to encourage the growth of companies. Um, and, and the moment a company stops growing, then you end up having another company come in and say, hey, we can do this better. We're going to go ahead and consume you and, uh, you know, do a merger and, and take your assets over and, and bring us to the next level sort of thing. So that's why I feel confident that using stocks as sort of tried and as sort of long running as they may have been uh, is still the tried and true way of getting involved in uh, in investing and building your assets for you know whatever future goals you may have I, I think that what you're seeing and Nick you mentioned you know robo advisors that that's a venue to go ahead and do your investing and have have it sort of automated for you. You mentioned the fact that, you know, even some of the uh, legacy platforms like a Schwab, Fidelity, uh, TD Ameritrade, um, you know, they, they've put themselves in positions where they're trying to compete by now offering things like uh, stock slices. So you don't, if you want to buy Amazon, you don't have to buy one share for three grand. You can buy a slice of Amazon um, in, in order to try and encourage people to understand that it's not, a marketplace that you can only get involved in when you have large dollars. And, and I think with a lot of the uh, products, you know, Liz mentioned that she was building product with Bessemer earlier. So, you know, she was probably part of this process of um, democratizing investing in, in terms of it, it doesn't have to be that you pick single stocks anymore. You have some great uh, package products in, in exchange traded funds or ETFs that you can purchase at low cost that will give you broad based exposure. So, I still sit here and say that, you know, I, I, I sort of don't care what the venue is. Um, for most people, 
the, the first place to start investing is inside of their company's 401k or retirement plan in order to start that base. But it's equally as important to, to save outside. And if you are, if you're, you know, a younger person, you know, that, that first decade that you have is, uh, incredibly important in terms of how much compounding you get over your lifetime of the assets that you put in um, in your 20s. So even if it's $25, $50, whatever it might be a month, you know, that, that's really going to benefit you in the long run. So with that, I will stop and let one of the other uh, panelists chime in with their thoughts. I'm happy to jump in here. And um, Joe, you said a lot of really good things. And I know um, you know, we're jumping in with, you know, Fidelity and Schwab and how do we think about Robo versus some of the bigger banks. Um, I, I think your 401k point is huge. I say that just because even some of my clients who have, you know, um, significant wealth and are working at an employer are not contributing to their 401ks. And I completely agree. It's all about the compounding effect. So for those who don't know, you can contribute up to $19,500 per year into your 401k. Um, and more importantly, a number of companies match, you know, up to 5% or 3% or what that is. So, so that's free money. So before we even get to the fidelities and the Schwabs and things, I think that is step one. Um, just because one, that money grow, grows tax deferred and two, you can't touch it until you're in retirement and you're not forced to take it until you're 72. So that is definitely a focus. In terms of how you think about Fidelity, Schwab, Robos, et cetera, I almost think it really comes down to how much knowledge do you have on investments, right? I think, you know, I, I must say a lot of our clients that come to us, they, they do have accounts, you know, not just at other private banks, but at Fidelity or at Schwab or whatnot. And, um, you know, mo I would say most of those providers have brought, you know, things like commissions down to zero. But if you don't know enough about investing or you're just kind of, you know, seeing what you see on CNBC and you see, you know, Google's up 60% this year and you want to buy it, like, that's where I think, you know, sometimes a place like where Carolina, Carolina and I are at or Joe, um, you know, we don't just do investments. We do things like planning and lending and helping you with a mortgage and banking and things like that. And so, you know, I think all of these platforms are amazing because they give access to everyone. You just want to make sure that you either are aware of the, you know, risks and return profiles that, uh, of things you're investing in. And if you're not, maybe there's someone through, you know, Fidelity who can advise you on these things, because I think that's the other key thing. You know, I've definitely had clients who, you know, try to do options on their own and then they lose a ton of money and said, like, why didn't I talk to you about this? And I'm like, well, let's talk about this. So I think the big piece of it is education as well. And I know Nick has a question on that down the line of, you know, how do we get educated and what do we read? So I'll hand it off from here. The only other piece I was going to add, because there was a lot of great points already made, is that I think for somebody newer to investing, um, this phrase was told to me and has really rung true. It's time in the markets, not timing the markets. And so the sooner that, and even if you're just keeping it simple and buying very low cost index funds, attract things like the S&P 500, the sooner that you're able to start getting that money invested and growing for you, that is really um, what will help you to be successful over time. And ultimately, we're all trying to outpace inflation and to meet spending needs, whatever it may be, having the money um, invested and working towards long-term growth is very important. And I think sometimes like things you see on CNBC or hear from friends or colleagues, like make it seem like it all has to be really complicated. And in some cases it can be depending on the sophistication level and what you're trying to accomplish, but certainly doesn't have to be. And, you know, I think just making the, making the decision about not, not overstressing the robo advisor or fidelity or how to do it, but just proceeding down a path and starting that sooner rather than later. And I'm happy to jump in. I saw Caitlin's question, I think, in the chat and now moving to Q&A. Um, it's a question we get all the time of how should we be investing our 401k? And again, Caitlin, I don't know you specifically, but um, assuming um, maybe this, given that this is, I think, a young alumni event, um, you know, stocks outperform bonds over time. 
cash right now is earning nothing. Um, I personally have my 401k and retirement assets in 100% stocks. Um, you know, again, it, it depends. Some people like to look at the portfolio all day, every day. And, you know, if, if it pulls back, that makes them nervous. And so maybe in that situation, you would add bonds. But, you know, if you have a 40 year time horizon until you're touching these assets, I would recommend being all in stocks. And then I'm sure your company employers have, well, US stocks are international. Again, happy to have a, a further conversation at a later date. But, you know, if we're all in our 20s, 30s, even early 40s, I would put um, your retirement assets, all in equities. Yeah, Liz, but again, for everyone is a little bit different. Um, so I don't want to make a broad generalization, but um, to Carolina's point about compounding, um, you know, that's the best way to do it. Go ahead, Joe. Oh, I was just going to say thanks for covering early forties because that's that's me, and and I would say that. Um, uh, yeah, now now we have other people saying don't discount the you know people in their fifties. Uh, yeah, agreed. I'm I'm 100 percent stock in my 401k. This is money that even in early forties I'm not going to touch for 20 years. And so if you look back 20 years uh, as to where the markets were, um, you know it, it's a situation where right now the the Dow, which is a, a decent indicator that a number that a lot of people have in front of them, is at 35,000. And 20 years ago we were in the you know the 6,000 range. So it's, it's, again, the system is built for this kind of growth. And unless we as a country change to some other sort of, um, you know, financial or philosophical system, uh, you're going to continue to see that growth. So it, it's worth uh, keeping pretty heavy in stocks in, in your 401k, unless it, it's going to give you heartburn to, to see the volatility in, within. So Sorry, I'll, I'll stop and kick it back to Nick so that we can. And in, or, and in term, but in terms of like the heartburn comment, because I think that is whether it's your 401k or other assets, equity investments are by nature meant to be long term investments. So if you're looking at it every single day and finding that you're getting yourself worked up, I think there's a couple of things you need to evaluate. Like, one, do, is this the right? In, investment for you because perhaps your risk tolerance, um, there's a mismatch there, but also too, like you really should be judging the performance over a longer period of time. And, you know, most of us are not day traders, like different story. Um, if, you know, active high volume trading is what you do for a living, but for most of us, and I tell my clients, like, don't, don't look through, don't go in every day online and, you know, do it when we have reviews and we can really talk through, but you can, you can quite literally give yourself heartburn and drive yourself crazy if you're checking nonstop and, um, you know, markets move around. So. Absolutely. Set it and forget it. Great, great piece of advice. Um, so I'm going to combine a couple of questions. Um, the first one um, comes from Matt from, from our, our viewer chat. Um, and I'm going to combine that uh, a little bit with some of the other ones. So, um, what process do you use to research um, potential, you know, financial advisors? And then, you know, coupled with that, what else do you do to sort of educate yourself on the landscape and, and the offerings and, you know, keep up with, with the markets and, and what, you know, sort of the latest is in, in your personal finance? In terms of the question of, how do you go? Um, how do you go ahead and you know think about different financial advisors? Um, there are a number of things that you can compare people on. You know, one, I think it's you need to get on the phone and talk to someone. It's got to be someone you feel comfortable with, someone who hears you and understand. You know, and asks you about your goals and what you're looking to do. Um, you know, the fit is very important. I would also say, you know, what can they offer? right? Is it just a brokerage platform? Are they looking to, are you looking for someone to advise you on your money? You know, do you want to consolidate with that with your banking and lending? Some people like that, others don't. Some are just, you know, like Fidelity and Schwab and, and, and just do the investment side of things. I would also ask people what their fees are. How do they get paid, right? Um, where Carolina and I are, you know, we're not paid by commission, so we don't, it doesn't matter to us what product we put you in. So we're not going to recommend a certain product just because we get a kickback. Um, so understanding how that advisor is compensated is also a question I would ask. Um, so I would say fit, fees, offering, um, I don't know, anyone else, am I missing anything? 
Another one I would ask is what other, um, tell me a little bit about other clients or families that you cover. And cause you ideally want to be covered by somebody who covers people like you. So I think that's also a fair question. How many clients do you have? I mean, obviously these are maybe more things that Liz and I are seeing as people who have higher net worths are considering, but I think anybody who's evaluating a, an advisor, like, I think those are completely fair game questions to ask. Yeah. And I'd say it's also, it also becomes a consideration as to, um, you know, how much the, the math Ted is going to matter to you uh, in, in terms of a, a large nationwide firm versus a smaller uh, independent firm. So that's something to consider as well. Uh, in terms of quantitative resources out there, you, you can, or research uh, areas, you can go ahead and look at something like a broker check. So uh, for, for people that do carry licenses in, uh, in the industry, in the securities industry, that, that's something where you can see what kind of license that they have. You can see if there are any sort of issues within their background. Um, SEC also has a, a resource called a, a, you know, Advisor Search. So that's another uh, resource that you can look at in order to uh, check out the person that you're uh, looking into. But I, I think Liz is completely right. It's, it's about fit and trust. The idea is that this is meant to be a long-term relationship. Uh, I, I would argue, and I think all, all three of us that are in the business uh, on this panel would argue that we're, we're looking to build long-term, deeply trusting relationships. And we, we want to know more about you than just, uh, you know, what positions you hold. And if you, you know, we, we want to do more than just have conversations about buying and selling stock, because actually to, to a large extent, that's, that's not the most important thing that we do. And so, um, so you want to you want to put yourself in a position where the person that you're sitting across from is someone that you can see wanting to work with for you know decades and wanting to really share intimate parts about your uh, about your life. So that, that's probably another thing I'd put out there. Last thing, and all three of us run into this quite a bit. Uh, you ask for referrals. So uh, you know, talk to friends of yours and say, hey, you know, do you have an advisor that that you work with? Do you like them? Um, that, that's, it, it's, a, it's a good way to get what Carolina was mentioning in terms of saying, you know, is this someone that works with people similar to you? You, you run in the circle that you run in. Um, if there, there's an advisor that is liked within that circle, then you would probably fit within their practice. Yeah, definitely can't discount the, uh, the personal relationship side of, of all of that and, you know, ensuring that there's trust and, and everything. Um, so my next question, I'm going to do a, another quick merge of, of a couple of things. Um, so Ms. Ney asked in the chat, you know, what are some alternative avenues for folks who, who might be interested in things other than the stock market and, you know, other than, you know, sort of traditional investments like that. And then I'm going to also ask, you know, about this notion that private is a new public with, you know, companies waiting longer and longer to actually IPO and some of the best returns have come from the private markets and, and um, how folks might, you know, be able to consider that as a, a potential avenue within, you know, their, their own personal finance. Um, maybe I'll, I'll do, I guess, the two um, have pretty brief comments, but maybe on the first around what do you invest in other than the stock market, I would say we talk a lot about that, but we definitely have, um, you know, I'd say everyone's probably been hearing about this housing boom. And so we've had a lot of clients who have a lot of real estate investments, right? As interest rates start to rise, real estate tends to be um, an area, another opportunity for investment. Um, so that, that's one we're talking about a lot because, you know, right now something like fixed income or bonds aren't yielding much yield or, or income. And so real estate, you know, um, investing, whether it's commercial real estate or personal real estate can be a great way to get income, um, in an appreciating asset as well. In terms of, um, private versus public markets, um, you know, a lot of our clients are in, a lot of our clients are business owners. And so they're keeping the, their companies private longer, but I would say, um, yeah, pr private markets or, or private equity, um, hedge funds tend to outperform public markets by, you know, eight to 9% annually. Um, that said, um, I think the one thing people don't talk about with private markets is they're not as liquid. 
liquid, meaning you can't just sell them tomorrow. So, um, you know, speaking back to the heartburn, if equities are going up and down and you don't feel comfortable, if you need to sell something, you can. But as a reminder with something like private and private investments, whether we're talking about private equity or hedge funds, they can have lockup periods of up to eight to 10 years. So that's just something else to be mindful of. Um, and typically for certain types of private investments, um, we are looking, um, the industry looks for um, very sophisticated investors with certain net worths. Um, so um, those are the comments for me, thanks. Just maybe to follow on that, I'll maybe work backwards in the questions, but there's, because of the reasons Liz said, the high um, liquidity, you know, the higher risk tolerance, you know, there, there are real industry rules around who can invest in these. I think for the person who has a very high net worth, a long-term time horizon, wants to look for, you know, idiosyncratic, not typical market beta, private investments can be um, a fantastic allocation to have in their portfolios, but they are, they're certainly not for, for everyone. Um, and in terms of alternatives to the stock market, I think if I was, a, you know, as a young person who is trying to get money invested, like Liz said, I think, you know, you're not earning really anything in fixed income. So I would probably pass on that. I mean, one thing that you'll probably hear a lot about is, you know, people looking to areas in cryptocurrency to add a small allocation is something that's not the traditional stock market, but um, you know, hopefully has growth potential over time as a way to add some um, enhanced diversification. But again, like that's another high risk asset. So that's not to be taken for granted. Yeah, I, I think that um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the private public question first. Um, I actually most recently was with a firm that was putting people into uh, private private equity, even down, you know, even as low as you know, fifty thousand, twenty five thousand dollar investments, and and that's pretty unusual. I, I know for the the ladies on the call, we, we understand that's that's a pretty low hurdle, um, and and the the danger has already been mentioned. I, I do think that there's a lot to be said for the fact that uh, life has changed in terms of going public. Uh, I think of Microsoft and the fact that, you know, for Bill Gates back in the day in the, in the 90s to realize his wealth and get it out of that stock and, and turn it from paper wealth into actual wealth that he could then turn into the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, he needed to go public. Nowadays, that's not the case. So when you look at Elon Musk and you look at something like SpaceX, you know, he's able to continue to do round after round, which is them calling out saying, hey, we want some more capital. Um, and he can keep it private and still manage it and actually have less regulation and red tape to deal with. And so there are a lot of companies that, that are avoid, and there are a lot of companies that are avoiding going public. And so you end up seeing the growth happen in the private side. Uh, Lyft was actually a great example of that. Lyft IPO'd at $71. And there were people that were advantaged by Lyft for a large period of time in the private market. If you bought it publicly, it IPO'd at $71, and then it proceeded to tank for the, you know, <laughs> for the preceding period. So it, there were people on the private side that made money and pretty much everyone publicly lost money. And, and that's a challenge that we're going to have to think about and deal with going forward. Um, and un undoubtedly the market will come up with a solution for that, that will make it so that it's more democratized so that everyone can uh, get access. And that, that does lead back to the, the question about what else besides stocks. And, and what's hard is because it's difficult, anything that you can get access to that's not equities, um, you're just not getting a lot of return for it. So that, that's, you know, there's no longer a, a savings account where you put in your money and you're getting 6% uh, you, you know, interest on it. So that's, that's the challenge. I, I do love what Liz said earlier about real estate. I think real estate is an area where um, it, it's non-correlating. So it means that it, it doesn't act the same way as the, the stock market. And it, it does two things in, in that it helps build equity 
And then it also uh, puts you in a position where depending on if you're a direct owner of that real estate, it can become passive income for you. So uh, for someone who says, yes, yeah, stocks are not for me, wh what else can I look at? I, I usually think the next venue to look at would be doing something in, in the real estate market. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely some good points. And you know, to follow up on, on the real estate question, um, that seems to have uh, have have really hit a nerve with our audience. We had a couple questions coming through um, to our our Q and A panel. Um, by the way, we'd like to request that you ask questions via the Q and A, not in the chat. That's the one I'm monitoring. That's where I'm keeping an eye on. So if you ask them in the chat, please just post them in uh, the Q and A board. So. A couple questions on real estate that I'm um, I'm gonna gonna merge into one. Um, one is how do you go about investing and doing that initial investment in real estate if you don't necessarily have you know a, a ton of capital lying around? And then how do you think about it in terms of um, finding investments with you know maybe dealing with tenants or um, possibly you know in other cities that, that you're not necessarily in and and those kinds of things. Yeah, I would say um, maybe a first place to just start um, if you're not someone who was ready to buy, you know, a property, an investment property, as, as Joe was saying, and being an owner and having a tenant pay you income, you know, another um, liquid option, uh, meaning you could sell it, you know, sell the investment um, pretty easily is something called a REIT. Um, so a real estate investment trust. Uh, this is essentially, you know, similar to you know, a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund where it pulls together a number of real estate investments. So, um, you know, you can look BlackRock, Schwab, J you know, there, JP Morgan, there are a number of different REITs out there. And so if someone is not necessarily very familiar with the real estate industry and what sectors within real estate, um, right, apartments, um, thinking about apartments, thinking about, um you know, there, there are many different sectors, warehouses, um, telecommunications, et cetera, you know, maybe looking at um, some of the already available REITs could be a good option, R-E-I-T-S. Yeah, and, you know, ultimately though, when, when you talk about a REIT, um, you're, you're especially a public REIT, one that you can purchase on, on the market, you're still effectively talking about equity or, 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 or the stock market, you're buying, you're, you end up buying a product that's exchanged on the stock market and the underlying positions are still typically companies that are in that real estate sector like you know, Toll Brothers, which is right down the street here in, in Ashburn, Virginia. Um, so it, it's not, you still don't own the actual you know, housing complex or whatever it might be. Uh, there are, I don't know, I've looked at them a couple of times, but I've never really uh, gone deeper. There are a couple of uh, platforms out there like Fundrise and um, what's, the, what's the other one? There's Fundrise and CrowdStreet, which speak about the idea of you being able to buy actual real estate as a participant at, at smaller levels. So that, that could be something to look into. Um, again, it, when, whenever you talk about some of these alternative platforms, it puts you in a position where typically you're, you end up taking on more risk. So it just becomes a, you know, a question of doing additional due diligence and uh, feeling comfortable with the fact that, you know, I, I like to call it a Vegas account. I mentioned my Coinbase um, account earlier. That, that's my Vegas account. If, if that goes to zero, it, it doesn't really matter. It's not what I'm depending on in order to uh, reach my retirement goals. And so uh, that's just something that you have to consider. I love the term Vegas account. I'm definitely going to steal that one. Um, so thank you to everybody who's submitting questions. Uh, we currently have 12 uh, up in our queue and 26 minutes to get through them. So I'm going to apologize in advance if I don't get to yours. Um, I'm going to try my best to, to really you know, get, crank through these and, and I'll, I'll try to get through as, as many as possible. Um, but you know, please keep submitting them. And you know, if we don't get to them, I, I apologize. Um, so another, you know, trendy topic these days uh, is ESG investing, and we have uh, a question on how do I get into investing through uh, ESG or, or social impact, and, and how do I do, um, you know, my personal finances with a, a socially conscious mindset? 
I'm going to start on this one because I'll, I'll start, I'll say something very short, which I think will be controversial, and then I'll, I'll stop talking. Um, I don't like ESG investment. I, I don't like them because of the fact that like, I'm seeing the eyes and like, oh God, I just lost everybody. Um, I, because of the fact that right now, I, I think they're just marketing. And I'm not against the idea of investing based off your, your ideals, your faith, your you know, environmental impact, whatever it might be. Conceptually, I love that. I think a lot of what you're getting out in the marketplace right now is just marketing. And I think what will end up happening is that at some point, ESG is going to be necessary and it will no longer be a separate category. It will be the mainstream. And when that happens, that's, that's when it will make sense to invest in it. Um, but right now, I think it's just a, a lot of good marketing to make people feel you know, warm and fuzzy about the, the topic and the idea. I think also to it's a very vast landscape. And what you realize is that people gener- sometimes mean what ESG means to one person may be a little different from what it means to someone else. So some people think about it really just on the exclusionary basis. So not having any companies in your portfolio that make weapons or tobacco, kind of like your sin stocks as they um, sometimes are termed, to the other end of the spectrum where you are proactively making investments in companies that are trying to achieve some greater good. So it's not necessarily that you're not trying to earn returns on your investments. That's certainly part of it, but also the actual core of the business is trying to, whether it's promote equality or something in education and then kind of like everything else in between. But there is certainly there's certainly a trend of people wanting to be much more conscious around understanding what's in their portfolio and the impact that it's having, not just the financial impact, but you know, what are these companies' values? Do they have women on their boards? Do they, are they um, cognizant of their impact on the environment? And I think that... Um, you know, personally, I think this is a trend that's probably here to stay, but I don't know if it's going to be, you know, as bifurcated, like you're either pro ESG or, or your portfolio is ESG or it isn't. I think, you know, we're probably just moving in a direction where ESG will become more of the norm. Yeah, definitely could, uh, could see ESG trend continuing and, and, you know, I, I certainly hope that it will one day become a an expectation rather than an exception, um, as I, I think you know some companies kind of treat it today. Um, so moving on to a couple of questions that we had about um, specific you know ways that folks have have maybe gotten paid that are are a little bit less traditional. So um, are there any broad lending solutions advice for entrepreneurs or business owners with liquidity events uh, like PALs or, or mortgages? Um, consider with a privately held company, or um, how does one handle, you know, receiving RSUs if your employer um, is, is somebody who, you know, who, who grants those? Um, and what are some, you know, techniques when when dealing with those kinds of um, liquidity events? I'm happy to start on the lending one. It's one our firm focuses on a lot. Um, I think the question was geared to someone who is a business owner. Um, so a lot of times, it, in my experience, my business owners um, have a lot of money and equity in their company, but they don't always have a lot of liquidity or a lot of cash. Um, and so one thing we've been doing with a number of business owners um, would be a traditional mortgage where typically you would put you know, 15 to 20% down and the bank finances the rest. Instead, we've done something called a pledged mortgage where you essentially pledge the assets that you have at a bank, the investments you have, and you can essentially um, put zero down. Um, So you don't have to put 15 to to 20% down for a down payment, use your investments as collateral, and then you can finance the full mortgage. Again, pros and cons to both. That means your mortgage payment will likely be a little bit higher because the amount of debt you have is higher. Um, But for someone who doesn't want to put down cash, that is an interesting option. Also for a business owner, who's looking to potentially sell a company or maybe the business owner who has a lot of cash on hand, um, we've been recommending clients buy the house if they can um, in full, in cash, and then putting a mortgage on after the fact. 
Um, and some may say like, why wouldn't you just do the mortgage? Uh, which is a great question. If you do a mortgage, the traditional way where you put 15 to 20% down, um, you, your maximum deduction is up to 750,000 versus if you buy the home in cash and put the mortgage on after, you know, somewhere between 30 to 90 days, um, you then actually are able to reinvest those proceeds and there's no cap on the deduction. So that's something we've been doing a lot, um, not to mention with, you know, interest rates at all time lows, um, you know, provided you're investing in, you know, potentially like stocks, you are getting a higher return on those investments than the rate you are paying on your mortgage. So that's what we call a, a positive spread. So those are just some thoughts on the lending side. I, I can chime in really quickly about RSUs. I, I have a number of clients that um, that part of their compensation is RSUs or restricted stock units or ISOs, incentive stock options. And basically that's another way for the company to pay uh, with the idea of trying to keep you a, a little bit more beholden to the company and, and, its, uh, and its progress. A good example down the street here in, in DC is Facebook. And I had, had a number of clients there and I would almost typically, again, everyone's situation is, is individual. We have, we're in a highly regulated uh, in, in, you know, industry, so we have to be careful about uh, truisms that, that go across the board. But when it comes to RSUs, I typically will tell people to liquidate them as, as soon as they're able to, uh, because again, this was money that the company gave you in, in lieu of paying you a salary or paying you as much in salary. And, um, and so ultimately your livelihood is, is that salary. You, you end up tying yourself in too much to the company by holding onto that RSU because you have your salary, you have your health insurance. In the case of uh, some of the tech firms, uh, my Facebook clients were eating every meal that they, <laughs> during the week on campus. So they didn't have any groceries or anything like that. And then it, all of a sudden, if they were to lose that job, like it, because something like COVID came along, it, it was it was going to impact them on so many levels. So, you know, plus for a lot of those companies that are paying via ISUs or uh, RSUs or ISOs, uh, you always have more coming down the pike. And so th there shouldn't be any fear of, oh, gosh, but I, I love my company. I, I can see that we're going to continue to, to do great. Well, that's fine because you'll have more and more uh, grants coming down the pike that that will help you fulfill that that future growth in the company. Awesome. Uh, Carolina or Liz? No, I was just going to say, I think Joe said it very eloquently. I think the conversation about selling RSUs right away is, is a great recommendation for the right person. It tends to be hard to do that because people feel so tied. But I think Joe's points around, you know, typically if you're selling one year, you've got other you know, RSUs or ISUs that will um, come due in the future years. And it just speaks to, as we've talked about, we've talked a lot about um, risk. And um, we have many a clients who have either inherited stocks um, from people um, and they're just so tied to the company. You know, I've got so many clients who say, but I want to hold Amazon because I do everything with Amazon. And they're not necessarily always thinking about it in a portfolio context. So typically, we'd recommend from a concentration perspective, as you think about your broader balance sheet um, and how much you have tied up in the company, you know, we don't like to see it more than, you know, depends on the investor, but 10 to 20%. Um, and again, depends on, on how comfortable you are, but, you know, having all of your money tied up in Facebook stock or even really 50% does add a lot of risk and concentration. The other piece I was going to add for business owners too is um, to become educated. And this is like part of what we do in our job when we meet with people on different um, tax strategies that you can use um, before you have a liquidity event. So whether, um, I'm not just to keep it high level for now, but any sort of pre-transaction planning. So maybe gifting shares of your private company before it gets purchased, goes public whatever the transaction is to capture a valuation discount um, is a very popular strategy as well as something called QSBS, Qualified Small Business Stock Exclusion. So if, you, if your company meets certain um, parameters, there's a, there's a checklist, but you know, it's a domestic 
C Corp, um, you know, different things you have to check off the box and you can have very, very meaningful tax savings when you go to sell the business. Um, in some cases you can exclude up to $10 million of gain, which is um, a pretty meaningful uh, tax savings for, for a business owner who, who qualifies for that. Yeah, I would definitely would love to have $10 million of taxes that I need to pay. That would be that would be great to, to, to start off with. Um, but saving that would be even better. It's a um, problem we all want to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a high class exactly. problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. Thank you so much for, for all of that. Um, so another um, good good chat question here. Um, and, and thank you to the anonymous person that asked this because I'm getting married in a few months. So I would like to know this answer as well. Um, as a married couple, who are, what are the top factors we should consider when doing um, the decision to file taxes jointly or separately for, for the very first time? As someone who just, um, so the tagline at JP Morgan is we don't provide tax advice, speak with your accountant. Um, but as someone who got married in 2020, Nick, I can tell you when my husband and I were doing our tax returns, um, we just went to the accountant and said, how much do we owe if we file jointly or separately? And the one to file jointly was we owed less taxes to the government. So that's kind of how we made that decision. I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, and, uh, but that, that's how I would respond to that. Yeah. The only other thing I was going to add, and I think that's generally what, what most people do is that if one of the spouses is not a U.S. citizen, I think that can add some different layers of, um, complication so but i think figuring out what you would owe each individually or filing jointly and the accountants can run projections sort of showing you the two options got it that's definitely good to know um so we're going to try to to crank through a, a few more of these questions here in our our last 13 minutes uh we have 12 open questions 13 minutes left so we'll, we'll try to get through as many as we can um, with the prospect of higher inflation and taxes looming, um, how has that changed the framework of um, portfolio advice that you're providing to your clients? We're doing rapid fire, get out of cash. <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> or, or just no, I, the thought being, if, or go ahead, Joe. I, I was going to say, I, I think the question is a little bit of a mismatch. Um, I, I don't think it's a question about portfolio advice, it, it, it's more a question about over, overarching planning. So when you talk about the idea of uh, inflation, you know, that, that's, you know, how that's going to impact, uh, port, how that's going to impact your plan is, is one thing. When you talk about um, increases in taxes, that, that's, not, that's not so much anything that has to do with uh, the, the investing side. Uh, I understand part of it may come from the idea of, well, but if I sell this and there's capital gains and, and those sorts of things, but that's, that's always part of the equation. And I think most of us don't want the, the, the phrase is you don't want the tax tail to wag the investment dog or something like that. I, I never get those phrases right. I, I think there's a, there's, there's a loss there. But anyway, um, so I, I think that it's really just a situation where via good planning, a good financial plan will lead to uh, good outcomes when it comes to being prepared for inflation, when it comes to being prepared for tax law changes. And, and that's, again, another reason why having that good financial planning uh, relationship is going to be so important because, you know, we just had a tax law change in 17. We're talking about another one now. Even if one doesn't happen now, it's going to happen again in 2026 because that's when the tax law change in 17 is going to sunset. And so you just always have to be prepared for, uh, for the landscape to change. Yeah, I think um, on the tax front, there's still so much that is ambiguous at this time and to be determined. So I think making sort of rash decisions um, about your portfolio as a result is not prudent. And quite frankly, I mean, earlier in this year when people were talking about, well, what if the capital gain rate matches income tax rates. I mean, that was when we were having something like that could perhaps more 
adversely impact the market. Um, but at this point, it seems like there will be changes for certain people. Taxes will be going up, but the you know sort of radical ideas that were talked about earlier in this year, in many cases, seem to have subsided a bit. Yeah, definitely. Only thing that is uh, certain is, is uncertainty, especially when it comes to acts of Congress. Um, so next question from, from Rachel, um, assuming that they are getting their full 401k match, how do you help your clients determine how much money to keep in the bank versus to put it in the stock market um, for money they might want in the next uh, five to 10 years for things like a, maybe a down payment? The, the way that I think about this is, um, you know, you, you always have to have enough for a rainy day. And that means something different for different people, depending on your short-term needs. So, you know, typically we advise our clients to leave, you know, one to two years worth of cash in the bank. Again, that could be six months for you. I, I don't know what income sources are like, but, you know, keep what you need for what you know of as your short-term needs. And so things that you're looking to do 10 years down the line, I would definitely look to get that invested. Um, so one to two years is, is pretty much how I think about it in terms of cash. Uh, but again, also, I also recognize we're working with clients who tend to have a lot of cash and, and maybe people are new to working and don't have that much on the sidelines, you know, keep a couple of months, you know, should something happen, as Joe said, and you don't have your job, you, you need what um, you should put aside what you need for day to day expenses. But then for things that are really, you know, three, five, 10 years down the line, I would look to invest that in the markets and not look at it every day. It's also ideal when you don't have to make decisions about your portfolio, i.e. sell positions just because you have a cash need. So in certain, you know, circumstances, clients that Liz and I work with, um, you know, we usually uh, set up things like lines of credit for people against their assets so that should something come up, they have a pool of essentially cash that they can draw on to fulfill that. But for like just more basic levels, I think when you're thinking about how much money to get invested, personally, I would say to err on the side of conservative, make sure you have enough set aside for your lifestyle expenses with some buffer that you deem to be appropriate for a rainy day fund. Because if you do need to sell to meet some cash need or spending need, you know, and you happen to be doing it on a it comes on a down day or a particularly volatile period, you know, that's, that's not a great outcome, but, um, so that would just be my additional two cents. Awesome. Um, so next question, um, comes from Ryuhan, um, and that is, can you recommend some books or channels we can look at to better educate ourselves about money and investing? And I, I think we touched on this, you know, very, very early on as well, but uh, would love to hear some specific specific advice. Uh, I'm just going to chime in quickly and say Khan Academy. I think Khan Academy is is a great place to go to get some uh, basic foundational information about a, a number of things. But uh, when you're looking at finance, uh, you can get some good foundation in place so that you'll be informed to go deeper into specific topics. Liz, Carolina, any anything you follow? I, I read a lot. I, I would just say try and keep a balance. Um, as you guys are look, reading different things, you know, CNBC may look may seem one way, CNN, Fox another way. Um, you know, be diversified. You know, if, if you don't necessarily want to pay for certain um, resources, you know, even just googling some of the banks um, research analysts will have different views on broad markets. Um, or different stocks, et cetera. So I would just Google a bank and you know research analysts and you can get different um, points of view or outlooks on the market going forward. But there's not, I, I don't know, there's not one specific um, uh, provider that I read. Yeah, I think we get flooded with so much really good information, but it's to Liz's point, like having a more balanced view, I think, for us makes us better advisors because we're not just spewing kind of like one, uh, one angle. So I think, you know, even if you're reading little bits from different sources, I think that, um, that's a good way to 
better educate yourself. For sure. And I'd also add, um, I'm a big podcast guy. I don't know how many other folks uh, on the line are, um, but a couple of my favorites that I, I listen to pretty much every day, um, Planet Money, uh, Odd Lots from, from Bloomberg, uh, Wall Street Journal has a, a really good daily one, um, and even Robin Hood has a Robin Hood snacks of, of some quick, you know, kind of here's what's what's going on in, in the markets today. Um, so, you know, for, for those who are our listeners, um, gonna shift a little bit um, and, and ask you guys, um, what is the biggest mistake that people make with their personal finances and, and how um, in, in your you know, observation does, does somebody uh, avoid that? Trend chasing is uh, definitely, definitely one. I think also just moving in and out of the market. So, you know, thinking that you're like the one with the crystal ball, who knows? Because remember, when you try to time the market, there's two decisions you have to get right when you get out, but also, which I would argue is the harder decision of when to get back in, so the top and the bottom. And, you know, I just, I think trying to get like cute with things like that tend to be some of the biggest mistakes that young or newer investors uh, make when they first start. Definitely don't get tempted by the, uh, the diamond hands, as they say. Joe, Joe Liz? For me, I, I just say um, n- not planning and, and not thinking and thinking that, you know, you're, it's too early to plan. It, I would argue you can engage with uh, financial resources and, you know, I, I, I have clients that I have clients I work with that have absolutely no assets. All they have is debt, but it's important. This is, this is a time of their life where in order to get to the point where they're going to be saving, they have to do some good planning. So I, I would say planning early and, and going back to that plan often is, uh, is something that people don't do. And by not doing that, they end up regretting it. The, the amount of times I hear from someone, it's like, oh gosh, if I'd only met you 10 years ago, or if I'd only done this, you know, 10 years ago, I'd be in such a better place. It's like, yes, you would be, and you should. So like, you know, I, I wish we could jump back in time and do that, but there, there's always, uh, there's always the ability to, um, to improve your situation by making sure that you're taking a look at it and keeping it, uh, you know, close to heart. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with both um, Carolina and Joe, you know, the trend followers is a, a great point. I can't tell you how many times people call me about Bitcoin or Dogecoin or the ARK funds. Um, and uh, or I had a client call me today for a stock that's up 100% and he wants to get in now. And, um, you know, th- there is um, so so I, I completely agree with you on that. And then the only thing I'd say about planning, um, which comes up, honestly, with a lot of our business owners who are very young. Um, a lot of people say, oh, I don't need to, you know, they've got kids and they don't need to plan because they're so young and they have time to do it. The tax changes that we're talking about right now, they're going to change five, 10 times in our lifetime. And it's not about having the final plan. It's about having a plan today, should something happen to you. Um, and knowing, as I think Nick said, and I'm not going to, that certainty is uncertain, if that's what you said. So, you know, setting up a plan today, should you not be here, if you're the sole income earner, what would happen tomorrow, right? That may not happen, and you may change that in five years, but I think having some sort of plan um, is crucial, regardless of where you are um, in your life. So Liz is not a Dogecoin fan. I will definitely make note of that one. Um, so I think we're, we're pretty much at, at about time here. Um, I'd like to, to thank all of you guys, really. Um, this was great. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I think Jamie wanted to, to make a, a couple of quick announcements, but um, thank you to all of our panelists and thank you to Jamie for organizing this. I hope everybody on the line really got something valuable. Um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is my name at, at Gmail. Um, also fit LinkedIn, I tweet sometimes um, and I'll, I'll give our, our panelists a, a moment if they have preferred ways to, to reach out or, or anything like that. I can certainly share all of your email addresses if you'd like. 
um, in the follow-up email that will include a recording of the program and some information about future events and a survey. So tell us how we did. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And I really appreciate uh, your time and your talent, our panelists and our attendees. My dog back here really enjoyed it as well. So I appreciate everybody. I hope you stay safe and healthy. And again, thank you for your time, talent, and for joining us today. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you.